what is India's strength? India's strength is the enormous diversity of the country, its culture and its people. India will be, within a generation, a urban majority country, which means we're going to see hundreds of millions of people moving into India's urban spaces. Now, when you're building a city, you're thinking in decades, maybe even centuries. Smart cities are about clustering smart people, smart institutions, and creating an economic model that can evolve with time. When we are designing a city, what we are really doing is to design a way of life. What kind of life will make us happier? So the first thing before we do anything is to take some time to dream without restrictions what the ideal way of life in a city would be, what the ideal city would be. It's about having smartness in every aspect of the city. It means a smart way of governing. It means smartness in the way institutions are managed. It means smartness in the way big pieces of infrastructure are set up and designed and maintained, and down to the smallest pieces of what seem to be low-tech innovations, but are smart nonetheless. A smart city needs to be a system which grows in an intelligent way, is quite compact, it doesn't have sprawl in terms of economic development. Smart means something quite different. It means thinking that the way the city is going to grow is not going to waste resources in the future. Smart city is a city that makes sure that all its citizens have a good quality of life. Also, it's a city where people are able to meet their aspirations. A smart city for a person in a low-income family is where their kids can go and access education, where they can go and access jobs. So I think the main sort of thing that a smart city needs to do is to be able to address quality of life. I have been obsessed with urban issues for a long time and to me transport was very peculiar. As society gets richer, there are more cars, more traffic jams. And to me, it was evident that we could not solve this with rail systems. They're extremely expensive to build and extremely expensive to operate. And then later I discovered the Curitiba model. And it was like magic. I said, this is amazing. This is the solution. So we took the Curitiba model and we made some improvements, which improved greatly its capacity. What gives capacity and low cost to a mass transit system is speed. And in order to have speed, you need that people board the bus extremely quickly. When a bus arrives at a station, you can get 60 people into the bus and 60 people out of the bus in seconds. We not only made infrastructure for pedestrians, but we made infrastructure for bicycles. And we built about 300 kilometers of protected bicycle ways. And it was a little crazy because almost nobody used bicycles at that time to go to work but we also wanted to not only facilitate people using bicycles to go to work, for a low-income person, this may represent a savings of a month and a half wages, but also because it creates equality. In this task of transforming our cities and making them livable and efficient, many people consider Ahmedabad to be at the forefront. One of the earliest projects that Ahmedabad did uh, was a street improvement project. This was in the early 90s when Ahmedabad improved one street to show how streets could be designed well. And the inspiration for this uh, came from street design projects in the United States. In the case of the BRTS, the inspiration was clearly from Latin American cities. So we had the mayor of Bogota come here to Ahmedabad to explain how he had built a bus rapid transport system. The other project that has done really well is the Sabarmati Riverfront Development Project. This is a multi-dimensional project that does many things simultaneously. It cleaned up a very messy, polluted river. It provided the city with a public realm all along the edge of the city. It provided housing for the people who got displaced by this project. Most importantly, it's a project that is self-financing. It uses no money from the taxpayer. Good city making is about two big things. One is the effect on the environment. 
making cities in such a way that they don't have a negative effect on the environment. And the second big issue is making cities that are kind also on the people who are there. So it has a social dimension. Mayors, governors, and city leaders can actually do an enormous amount in a short period of time to make them environmentally and socially more sustainable. If you take this vast project happening here now in this city, London, at King's Cross, what is special is that they're actually trying to think long term over the next 20, 30, 40 years. The public sector has put in all the major infrastructure, so public transport, water, sewers, and all the things you need for that, and provided sort of the framework for sustainable development. And then the private sector has come in and made the investment that you actually need to provide jobs, housing, and also all the sort of the infrastructure of uh, making people feel that they live in a place that they want to be at. We've had a number of big initiatives that improved the city's smartness. One of them was Plan YC. We took a detailed look at what was going on in New York, what was going wrong in New York, and what the trends were over 20 years, and how, in a strategic way, we could affect those trends. New York City introduced more than 800,000 wireless water meters on every building around the city that has a connection to the water system. It sounds mundane how you keep track of who's using how much water and how they're paying for it, but it's actually a very big deal. It lowers labor costs. People don't have to go onto your property to check how much water you've used. It makes the bills far more, more accurate, which means that the individuals have confidence that the government is not overcharging them. We've worked really hard to make sure that we have a state-of-the-art recycling system where garbage is separated, it's collected in a way that doesn't get it contaminated, and we've built recycling plans here in the city that create jobs and allow us to turn our waste resources into industrial products that are then going to be either exported or used within the city. A project like the High Line, for example, was truly transformative. The High Line was this abandoned elevated rail yard in an old warehouse district. And by turning it into this beautiful elevated park, we've actually changed that neighborhood's entire character. You can't be smart if you're only thinking about traffic or only thinking about economic growth. You have to think about multiple things at the same time. There are sort of very good examples in, around the country of how uh, you've been able to do very progressive things about public service delivery, uh, water, transport, energy, land. The fact that you, know, you can equip most of your vehicles, whether it's to pick up garbage or the buses to run public transport with GPS. And there, has been, there are some good examples of use of technology around fare collection, around uh, vehicle monitoring, around uh, metering. And you can use all of these things to be able to then sustainably operate and maintain you know, the infrastructure that you've built. Mumbai has seen a lot of very progressive redevelopment projects. In the last 10-15 years, has spent upwards of almost 50,000 crores to build new roads. And in Mumbai, only 5% people use the car. Indore, for example, you know, has bus rapid transit on AB Road Corridor, which is one of the busiest streets uh, in Indore. And it has completely transformed how people now think about transport. They all they see an option which is without the cars. All of our cities have core areas. All of our cities have been built around history and heritage. So I think you know, we should try to see how we can leverage that. Typically, most cities will have either a big river running through their city. And this is also a huge opportunity on how you can sort of you know, leverage this whole interaction between the residents of the city and these sort of natural natural elements. So I think these are all sort of strengths of Indian cities that we need to see how we can harness. The ideal vision for a city in India is actually that the model of growth is one which is much truer to its roots in terms of India. Think of the number of people who use bicycles. Think of the uh, energy produced by the high streets in uh, any Indian city, people living together, close to each other, doing business, doing transactions and living close by. 
when we create a whole large number of smart cities, we want in fact that each of these cities has its own strength, its own personality. It builds on its own cultural, economic, and geographical strengths. Therefore, when you're dealing with smart cities, you also want to deal with models that are very diverse and have in very diverse outcomes. I would say at least 90% of the cities which will exist in India in the year 2060 or 2070 or 80 has yet to be built. So India could build cities that are totally different than any other city which has been built in the world. Smartness can help India's cities really achieve that world-class status, not for, for bragging rights, not because just of economic growth, but because that's how Indians can have more productive, healthier, happier lives. Cities are not just to produce wealth. Cities are meant to produce citizens. And if we can create the processes whereby we give a sense of ownership to everybody in the process of urban development, this is what we will end up doing.